Few diseases can claim to have had such a large impact on humanity as malaria. The death tolls are staggering at around 2 million a year, with hundreds of children dying from the disease each day. It is a disease that we have known about for centuries. With treatments and methods of prevention developed proving effective, though some were incredibly damaging. Yet for much of the world, notably Sub-Saharan Africa, malaria remains a devastating disease. In today's video, we will cover the malaria life cycle, its destructive impact, and what is being done to combat the disease. Malaria is rightly linked to mosquitoes. Though, it's important to understand the role that mosquitoes play. Female mosquitoes of the genus Anopheles are the vector by which the parasitic organism named Plasmodium is able to spread. It is only the female mosquitoes that bite and drain blood, injecting the malaria parasite as they do so into the human host. These mosquitoes are found across much of the world, though these days they are very much limited to tropical areas and sub-Saharan Africa. These mosquitoes have a preference for human blood, meaning they are an effective spreader of the disease. What's more, they will lay their eggs in all manner of stagnant water sources, from marshes and swamps, to wells and cisterns, and even puddles. There are four types of plasmodium that are transmitted by mosquitoes that can cause malaria. Plasmodium is a single-celled organism that will infect a mosquito's saliva glands. When the infected female mosquito bites and drains the blood of a human host, it will also inject sporozoite of the plasmodium. These sporozoites are the spore-like stages of the parasite's life cycle and are capable of movement. They will make their way to the infected person's liver, where they will begin to reproduce asexually. The malaria parasite will begin to reproduce within the liver cells, until the point that they reach a critical mass and rupturing the cell, releasing more of the organisms to continue to infect more liver cells. The next goal of the malaria parasite is to enter the host's bloodstream. It is in the blood that the male and female gametocytes will begin to be produced. This is in the same manner as in the liver, but this time infecting and bursting the red blood cells. It is through the destruction of the red blood cells that a person will begin to feel the symptoms of malaria. Once the gametocytes are in the bloodstream, an uninfected mosquito can then suck the blood from an infected person, also consuming the malaria parasites. It is within the mosquito that the malaria parasites will reproduce sexually, the subsequent sporozoites then being ready to be injected into another host, and thus the cycle starts over again. Once a person is infected, it can be very difficult for the cycle of infections to be broken, as the mosquitoes will continue to infect the population. As for the symptoms, the infected person will start to notice these within 7 to 30 days of infection. The usual symptoms are fevers, chills and sweating, and will often come in a series of bouts hours at a time fluctuating between feeling hot and cold. Vomiting, muscle aches and diarrhea are the other signs of infection. The problem is these symptoms can be mild and may be seen as something far less serious than malaria. For children, the danger is heightened as they tend to have more general symptoms such as fever, cough and diarrhea, often resulting in a misdiagnosis. Malaria can also cause anemia, exhaustion and jaundice as a result of the destruction of the host's red blood cells. Without treatment, kidney failure, seizures and death can occur. Whilst evidence would suggest that malaria was brought to the Americas as part of the Columbian Exchange or through the transatlantic slave trade, it would be in South America that a potential cure was discovered. Spanish missionaries learned that various fevers and chills were being treated by the indigenous people of modern-day Ecuador with a powder derived from the bark of the cinchona tree. Jesuit priests would use the powder for treating malaria where it proved to be effective. These priests would take their newly found knowledge and provide cures for the elites of Europe. With this secret, seemingly miraculous cure, the wider world had access to what would be the first effective treatment. 
as the bark of the so-called fever tree contained quinine. In high enough quantities, quinine can provide relief for a person infected with malaria, as it can stop the parasites from growing and by killing them. Quinine was often taken with water, creating what was known as a tonic. This tonic water, whilst providing a level of protection, was a bitter concoction. As a result, the British colonials in India began to mix the tonic with lemon, lime and gin. We therefore have malaria to thank for the invention of arguably the second best cocktail, the gin and tonic. Quinine, however, does have a number of side effects, notably tinnitus, deafness and vision impairment. Whilst a cure for the disease was found and refined, malaria was not readily understood for many more centuries. It was not until 1897 that British doctor Ronald Ross proved that mosquitoes transmitted the malaria parasite responsible for the disease. This built upon work and research done by Patrick Mason, who was the first to identify that mosquitoes could transmit pathogens in their bites, and hypothesized that mosquitoes were responsible too for malaria. Once it was confirmed that mosquitoes could transmit malaria, the question then arose just how best to combat the disease. Two general solutions were given. Deal with the parasites once in the human body, or to deal with the mosquitoes. This can perhaps be best seen in the various works undertaken in the United States during the 1930s. Vast public works set about draining much of the habitat of the mosquitoes, such as mill ponds and swamps. When combined with better access to affordable healthcare, malaria cases in the United States started to decline. But perhaps the most controversial of the methods employed was the use of DDT. DDT, or dichlorodiphenyl trichlorothane, was identified as a potent insecticide in the 1930s. Field tests of the chemical proved that it remained effective weeks after the initial spraying. The National Malaria Eradication Program began in 1947 and was overseen by the newly created CDC, or the Center for Disease Control. More than 6.5 million homes were sprayed with DDT. The drive to drain mosquito habitats continued, often accompanied by the spraying of DDT sometimes from aeroplanes. To provide an example of the effectiveness of this program, in 1947, some 15,000 malaria cases were reported. By 1951, malaria was eliminated altogether from the United States. However, this did come at a cost. The fallout from the spray of DDT resulted in the thinning of bird shells, and therefore declines in bird populations such as the bald eagle, the osprey, and the brown pelican. DDT is also considered a likely carcinogen in humans, as well as causing issues with both male and female reproduction. Whilst the impact of malaria on modern history is profound, this is not the full story. The earliest evidence of malaria was found in ancient Egypt. DNA of malaria parasites have been found in the tissues of mummies, as well as evidence of large quantities of garlic being consumed to ward off mosquitoes. Malaria was also known for a time as the Roman fever, referring to a particularly deadly strain of malaria that was found in the Pontine marshes. It is even postulated that an epidemic of malaria in the 5th century may have played a part in the downfall of the Roman Empire. It was during the European Renaissance that malaria was given its name, being Italian for bad air. The belief that it was spread by toxic air or vapours this was in line with the miasma theory of disease, which stated that many diseases were born through the air, notably through bad smells. It has been speculated that one of the reasons that enslaved Africans were brought to the Americas in such great numbers was in part due to their resistance to malaria, especially when compared to European workers or those held under indentured servitude. In the southern colonies where malaria was rampant, plantation owners would exploit African slaves and reap the benefit of a labour force far more resilient to malaria. In the north colonies, there was little need for large numbers of such malaria-resistant labourers, 
Whilst this is but one theory behind the development of the transatlantic slave trade, it is interesting to take into account the role that malaria played in major historical events. Whilst many warlords, conquerors and armies have doubtlessly laid low many opposing forces, it is hard to ignore the role that malaria has played in conflicts throughout history. It is believed by some historians that Alexander the Great succumbed to malaria, along with Oliver Cromwell and Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is thought to have suffered from malaria-like fevers only a few months before his death, but it was the common soldier who would often suffer from malaria due to living in squalid, overcrowded camps. Malaria has also played a role in slowing or even stopping many an army. Attila the Hun's invasion of the Roman Empire was said to have been stopped by Pope Leo I, but the Huns were undoubtedly already weakened by the Roman fever. For the British Empire during the Revolutionary War, the southern colonies were rife with malaria. British troops deployed to these regions had little in the way of experience in dealing with the disease. In 1780, the British colonial forces were bested by a malaria epidemic, which would take out entire forts at a time and at its peak affecting around half of the British troops. During the Second World War, malaria was a constant battle that was waged for troops in the Pacific theatre. The need for malaria-free soldiers was a major reason for the works undertaken to rid the United States of malaria and to obtain medications that would be effective at combating the disease. Before the onset of World War II, the Dutch had a monopoly on the production of quinine, having grown vast quantities of the trees in their colonial holdings in Java and holding much of the quinine in warehouses in the Netherlands. With the occupation of both the Netherlands by Nazi Germany and the occupation of Java by Imperial Japan, the Allies lost access to a vital drug and needed a replacement. The preferred anti-malaria drug used by the Allies was quinacrin, otherwise known as atabrin. However, this drug did have some rather nasty side effects, meaning that the troops would not take the medicine. The most common side effects were headaches, diarrhea and sickness with some even experiencing their skin turning an off-yellow colour. Today, malaria remains a major threat. According to the latest figures, there were 241 million cases of malaria in 2020, which was up from 227 million cases in 2019. Around 627,000 people died of malaria in 2020 alone. The vast majority of deaths occurred in the African continent, with around 80% of these deaths being children. Insecticide is still a widely used method of dealing with mosquitoes, though debate still exists as to the use of DDT. The use of anti-malaria drugs is now only one part of the story, as the parasite has developed drug resistance particularly in Southeast Asia. These harder strains become more prevalent and new drugs are needed to fight back. It is therefore vital that surveillance and understanding the genetic makeup of the parasite strains is used in addition to other methods of control. A vaccine known as the RTS is now being rolled out in order to increase a person's tolerance to the disease. Some of the greatest success can be seen in Senegal, in the year 2000, the rates of malaria infections were as high as 250 infections per 1,000 people. By 2020, it had fallen to just 50 infections per 1,000 people. It has been through genetic mapping, better understanding of the disease amongst the population, and through better access to healthcare that Senegal has seen a decline in cases and deaths. Malaria has long been a dangerous and debilitating disease for humanity. Whilst there have been successes, there is still plenty more to be done to eliminate the disease. The rise of anti-resistant parasites is certainly alarming, but it is not without hope.